Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be a part of this webinar uh, today. Uh, as Jeff said, I'll be talking about drainage water management and applications uh, for reducing nitrate uh, loads from drainage systems and also some considerations related to lands that are where liquid manure is applied. Uh, Jeff talked about the extent of uh, uh, drainage across the, the Midwest, and it is uh, one of the most dominantly subsurface and surface drain uh, production regions in, in North America, particularly with subsurface drainage. But it is the dominant water management practice. Over the years, we've moved from just conventional drainage to a system that we call water table management. And with water table management, we can have this conventional subsurface drainage. We can, with, some, with a device, we can then go to control drainage. And then if we've got cheap water, we can do sub-irrigation if the soil conditions are just right. And so I'm going to spend more time or most of the time on control drainage Okay. With controlled drainage or drainage water management, we are basically managing the outlet of the uh, drainage system or the, outlet of the drain outlet of the field. And we can do that with uh, the several devices or structures that are on the market. But we can do that. And we're actually uh, conserving drainage water. And we found that it, there really is uh, not much need to drain every drop of water, gravity water, out of the profile. And so uh, we've, uh, we've learned quite a bit in the last five or six years about the benefits of drainage water management. And I'll share a few of those with you here. <clears throat> this practice, drainage water management, is NRCS practice code 554. And there's a major effort for us to uh, implement this across the Midwest and uh, primarily to have an effect uh, on reducing nitrate loads to surface waters. And we, this is important as we look at soluble nutrients like nitrate and like phosphate and their discharge or their movement to uh, surface water bodies like uh, the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Erie and the Mississippi River Basin to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a, it's a uh, water quality practice. And there are some minor or very small yield benefits that can be gained by using this practice. The practice is probably, in Ohio at least, the practice has been used quite a bit on drained cropland that has, uh, that does receive manure, uh, either liquid or solid manure or semi-solid manure applications uh, once or a year, every year or so. And uh, that's where we've seen the, the most, uh, most uh, implementation of the practice up until about two years ago. And so uh, we're moving with a lot of uh, sites being implemented with controlled drainage because of some state and federal cost share dollars. And with the USDA, it is a, uh, E554 is an equipped eligible practice. <clears throat> and just a couple of points on drainage water management. Uh, we, we would like to, uh, like you to manage the outlet. And I don't suggest uh, putting a plug or a pneumatic uh, plug in place or capping it off with a valve. But we would like the landowner or the crop consultant or staff member to be able to manage that outlet by either raising or lowering the flashboards that are in the structure. And so it, we have a lot of capability, and we've got a lot of range there to hold the water table in if we do have a water table. So it's, uh, it's important to know that we're not just plugging the drain. And there could be some adverse consequences to actually just closing off the drainage system on some landscapes. This is uh, the field in southwestern or western Ohio. We have two, two management zones. And uh, both of these are, are retrofitted with uh, controlled drainage structures. And we were doing comparisons here of, of yield benefits and water quality uh, benefits, improvement benefits uh, on this particular field. This is roughly about, uh, I'm thinking about 50 acres or so. so. And the structure for both sites are located here. And the main, so this site runs 
a tight line all the way down to this point and this main runs and there's two structures side by side at this location. So we've got, for this case, two management zones. But the entire field can be managed uh, under the same water management strategy. Okay. What we've learned, uh, probably going back, with data going back to 10 years or more, uh, with Dr. Fauzi's uh, data from uh, the Soil Drainage Research Unit here in Ohio, is that we have a lot of, we learned that we can have the expectation to reduce nitrate loads by 50 percent, up to 50 percent. And there are some cases where it may be a little bit more, and there could be some cases where it's uh, quite low, could be quite low. But it all uh, revolves around managing the outlet of, these, of the drainage system by using the control structure and moving the flashboards uh, up and down. What we've learned uh, is that on the, on the average, over all of these sites that were, that were work was done in the past uh, five years, four years, that we don't change concentration of nitrate very much. And in some cases, the, they're statistically equal uh, from the drain side versus the managed side. Uh, but there are some cases where there is difference. But what we're doing is we're looking at the load reduction, and that's, that is a pretty dominant reduction. So we are changing the outflow volume on these fields. And we look, when you look at the outflow, outflow volume on an average annual basis, uh, we can have a significant reduction in the amount of water that is released to surface waters. And with a, with a pretty much constant nitrate concentration, then we are reducing the pounds of nitrate nitrogen that are discharged to surface waters. And this is one of the reasons why this is a practice that we're promoting across the Midwest appropriate landscapes. Jane Frankenberger at Purdue University led an effort to uh, develop this nice bulletin and it's available online uh, from Purdue. But it goes through a lot of questions that farmers and technicians and uh, agency people were asking us in the earlier part of the, our, our uh, implementation of this practice in the Midwest. So it's the real world questions and I think the, the bulletin is really quite valuable. So take a look at this if you want some more background information. When we look at drainage water management benefits, uh, we're, we're conserving drainage water. Uh, and this water has potential for crop water use, crop use. And so there is a, some potential for improvement in crop yields. There is definitely a water quality improvement. There are cost share opportunities. Uh, we have some potential in some landscapes to have an improvement in, in channel base flow. Uh, and then also a potential for recharge depending on the subsurface soil and geologic conditions. It has excellent application for uh, drain cropland where manure is applied. And there, are, there probably are a few others that I've forgotten. Negative aspects. And let me point out uh, get the green arrow down here. <clears throat> this statement here is the probably main, the main result of why we can have negative aspects or negative impacts. And that comes back to poor management or poor construction of the system and maybe a combination of both. Just like any type of agricultural system, if you have poor management, you're not going to get the same result as you would <clears throat> with better management. With poor management, we might see an increased rate of runoff and then increased rate of soil erosion. And that would come back to managing the boards too high so that we don't have any storage in the profile. Uh, by not managing it properly, we can have limited or no supplemental water for crop use. We might have reduced yields if we're trying to maintain the outlet at a too high level. Uh, no uh, water quality benefit. And if we are having no water quality benefit with NRCS or the state agencies, then our cost share dollars are, are wasted. And your dollars are wasted in these efforts. So it is important to manage this, uh, this system properly. And with the man proper management, and if the system was installed properly, uh, you can you can have some positive a lot of positive benefits from this application. The structures look uh, like a lot of these. Uh, this is a, a structure that's manufactured in Iowa. Uh, there are now two or three other companies that have their design of, of a structure. 
And uh, so they're, they're out there. They're, they're common. Uh, any drainage company, drainage tubing company, can, can provide a linkage to where you can uh, purchase these uh, structures. Concrete, this was the one that was recently installed in Northwest Ohio. Uh, this is the ADS, Advanced Drainage System, a uh, product that they came out with about two years ago. And it functions very, very similarly to the AgriDrain structure in terms of the flashboards that can be uh, moved up and down in the structure. Now, proper installation and management or maintenance is important. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, pictures and videos of, of installation of these structures. And I, I would say that we, they need to be and can very easily be placed on solid soil and not an undisturbed soil. Uh, we always advise to use an anti-seep collar even on flat landscapes. Uh, hand backfill. All of the structures come with notation that they should not be machine uh, backfilled and should not be compacted. I always recommend using you know, proper fittings uh, for the pipe and the pipes, and the joints should be watertight, uh, up to about 20 feet on either side of the structure where you have the room to do that. Non-perforated pipe on both sides of the structure, and again, pro approximately uh, 20 feet, and no gravel or sand uh, surrounding the pipe. We want soil to go back in on both sides of the structure, so we're isolating it from the water table that may be, uh, as best we can, the water table in the field. There's minimal maintenance with these, but an annual check to look at the gaskets on the flashboards is important. Uh, the gaskets uh, can be worn over a period of time and uh, keeping the tracks and uh, grease so they move easily. And each flashboard, uh, each uh, structure will have an abundance of flashboards and a tool to move the flashboards up and down. So it's important to, to keep that tool in place at the structure uh, so it's e more easily and uh, better uh, to be able to, easier to go in and make some adjustments in the profile. <clears throat> We've had a lot of discussions on how to manage these systems, and this is uh, something <clears throat> uh, that NRCS and, uh, came up with. Uh, it's a nice illustration, and Dr. Fauzi made a few uh, uh, revisions on this. It kind of emphasize that we need to have a little more time from uh, moving from planting to root establishment, and then before we start to uh, raise the outlet, and if we have water, to be able to make some use of that water. But I'm going to show you in the next slide a, a real-world application, which is similar uh, to this, but based on, our, on a real-world farm in Ohio. <clears throat> the uh, actual board setting that's in place here is the red line, and that's what the farmer uh, put in. That's what the farmer decided to use after his first year of working with us. The green line is the board setting we uh, recommended in the earlier part of, the, of his uh, use of the structure. And in this particular case, you can see the difference between the red line and the green line in terms of how much water he could have saved in the springtime and early growing season that the crop possibly could have used. And you'll note that we, we end up, this is water that he captured that we would have let go. And this is, uh, this, this, at this point, we entered into a drought period of time at this location. And had about two to four weeks of drought in that general location. OK, I want to move on to applications for drain crop, for a drain cropland application of liquid manure. And this is a, is a hot topic in Ohio and other places across the Midwest. Uh, it's not very complex. Uh, basically, you're putting a structure in at the outlet. And you maintain that outlet, uh, that structure actually may, may uh, have a higher setting in the, board, in the structure with the boards when you're going to uh, uh, do a land application of the water. Uh, you have to be careful that you don't have a lot of drain flow, otherwise we may see water overtopping the top board and it'll be mixed with manure. So, you know, if the drains are really flowing, that's probably not a good time to be able to apply liquid manure. Um, we want the, all the same things that, that uh, went into play 
with a traditional I got to find that. Oh, there it is. I got to find that green thing here. The uh, all the recommended uh, fittings and recommended uh, white making and watertight. Everything goes the same. And there are some cases where you might be able to add some storage, some retention storage, in the at, near the outlet if you've got water reaching the uh, the outlet a little bit too fast. Now, Ohio, okay, anti-seat collar, and this is an example of one that's here in Columbus at our agronomy farm. Uh, this is uh, from a Northwest Ohio application. The, the contractor was very concerned about having water move too quickly to get into a storm sewer, a storm system. But it, there's a lot of applications of these uh, uh, anti-seat collars. This is a case where the structure, in my opinion, and against our advice, was placed too close to the edge of the, of the bank. And the farmer wanted to have plenty of room in this area to be able to move equipment without damaging uh, the structure. And over time, you can see that this is leaning a little bit, and we have had some problems with this type of installation. Initially, there was no anti-seat collar put on this, and this is perfectly flat landscape. And if you look at, this is the condition that we, uh, we saw after about a, a half a year of use. And so it's good to uh, place the structure where you can avoid machinery operations and uh, take advantage of buffer areas or the interface between cropland and the buffer areas. But putting it on the edge of the bank is not probably the best application location. This is a case where the structure was, uh, and the whole the, the outlet system, the, the tight line, uh, that the pipe they put in on both sides of the structure was embedded in gravel. Uh, they used uh, non-perforated single wall pipe, which we don't recommend uh, because it's, uh, it moves around too easily. And so they didn't use sealant around the joints. They had gravel underneath everything from the where the main outlet came off of the drainage system all the way to tying into a, a roadside drain. And uh, this particular case was an overhead irrigation system with uh, discharging uh, tertiary primary or secondary treated wastewater. And this led to an illicit discharge uh, citation. So it, it, doing it right is very important. Now, I just wanted to plant the seed in with you that there is a way to, when we've got uh, a lot of movement of the manure water moving through the profile quickly, and particularly if we were applying it on the surface and we've got some pores or uh, cracks in the soil surface, to be able to put a retention reservoir close to the outlet. And this is just an extreme case here, but there are a lot of products on the, on the market that could be used for this. Uh, Ohio NRCS has come up with a couple of drawings which uh, probably came uh, I'm not sure where they came from, I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, being able to put a retention uh, section in the outlet pipe on the upstream side of the structure, and you notice the flashboards are all the way to the surface, are very near, and so this will this would be a place where, uh, with a port going to the surface where you could uh, pump the water out if you had a large amount of water being filling up in that uh, detention, and then that could be reapplied. Uh, to back on the landscape. And so with that, uh, I think it concludes my presentation.